Hey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You're uh, you're back with potential to be okay. Mm-hmm. So we had to do this one. We simply had to. Uh, this evening's episode, very special episode. We're gonna try something we uh, haven't done before on the show, which is to do uh, some top ten countdowns. Yeah, and um, we decided today to do arguably the worst actor ever known to the history of mankind, Mr. Tommy Connery. Interesting fact one is real nice. I, I know. <laughs> Come on. That's easy. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to have people shit their pants. Saying, the worst actor ever? All right, that's reserved for Chris Evans. We so. might have... Uh, I, I, I was going to say, some people might have switched it off already. But, but <laughs> yeah. I, They're like, well, this is outrageous. You know, he was a, a goddamn... Perfect. He was not a dirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So was Elton John. That doesn't make you incredible. But this man was incredible. Yes, yeah, so uh, the terrible day has, has come upon us uh, a little over a... No, not quite a month ago, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, late October of 2020, in case you're listening to this in the future. Anyway, Sir Sean Connery finally died at the age of 90. Of natural causes, I'm happy to say. Yeah, I mean, this death... It sucked, but, you know, it, it went to tell us there could only be one, so... <laughs> There can only be one. So I guess, in honor of Mr. Connery, we decided to do top 10. For me, I defined it by best performances he did in a movie. You did the top 10 best movies overall. Yeah, this is funny, because I just said this would be a cool idea, and we came away with two completely different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, mine is just my basically my personal favorites out of his whole yeah. film career. Yours is a little bit more sophisticated than that, I would say. Yeah, because like some movies I've seen where like an actor does a really, really, like just a fantastic job at their role and their performance but the movie overall sucks. A perfect example that I can think of is Gangs of New York. I think the movie's terrible, but I think Daniel Day-Lewis was absolutely incredible in that movie. Hmm. Like he made that movie tolerable for me to watch it. But if you take him out of it, the movie really doesn't serve it much justice. So like there's there's quite a few Sean Connery movies I've seen where movies just, you know, it's either just it's bland or it's terrible, but he does a really great job at the role he does. So, you know, that's kind of how I approach it. Like, what were his finest performances that I have seen? And I'm just like, wow, that's really good. Even though maybe the movie overall wasn't so much so. It's a good point. It, I, I th in, in tribute to the great man, I, I think that's something you have to say that, like, no matter what scenario he found himself in he the movie was always improved by him being there i think mm -hmm. he never felt silly in a role he always treated it like with absolute professionalism yeah and somehow that's just like you can make anything work if you just have there's to... certainly a difference between european actors and american actors i think it certainly so. has that more of the shakespearean quality which i think you kind of mentioned like the grace the eloquency you know yeah. the seriousness to role that they really took to heart. I mean, you don't really find many people, like you can find in the Broadway actors, um, but they don't really translate here to like, you know, Hollywood movies overall, really. But over there, you know, it's it's kind of where like a lot of the European actors kind of get their start right here. And, you know, Sean Connery, he didn't even start off as an actor. He was like a coffin maker. He was like a milkman <laughs> um, before he really got picked up. And, you know, he did some modeling. And I think he was also in the Navy at one point. Yeah, he was in the Navy and he, and, uh, he was a bodybuilder, I think. Yeah, he was a bodybuilder too. too, yeah, and then he kind of got picked up and it started from there and that's, you know, where the span of like 50 years of acting just happened to be. Yeah. So, um, question for your list here. Did you rank it by 1 through 10? Like, what was the best and what was the 10th best? Or did you just throw 10 random movies and you're like, I don't have, I'm not even going to try and organize what what's his best and what's his um, tenth best, I guess. You could I, say. I I did a little of both. I tried to not be too repetitive. I guess I would say I tried to pick ten movies that I thought were each unique, mm -hmm. but more or less, it's yeah, my ten my ten favorites. Okay, I, I do. Say. I chose I how I broke it down is ten ten what I thought ten was ten of his best performances, but I did rank one as number one. The one movie I thought, wow, he really took over here. Hmm, okay. So I did did rank one movie in there. And yes, there's going to be a couple James Bond movies in here, <laughs> right? Oh, oh wait, did you, <laughs> nobody's going to be upset about that, are they? Yeah, yeah, some people might. They might be like, hey, you're just going to choose some James Bond movies. Yes, you want to know why? Because he was fucking great. He's the greatest Bond actor of all time. 
I, yeah, I think there. I think it'd be it'd be shocking if there were none. Oh, uh, right! But, but, like but you, but you're not know. a human if you can't put one movie. It's like trying to list like Roger Moore's like ten greatest movies. <laughs> like, there's gonna be one movie in there where you're like, well, I guess Moonraker or Octopussy is pretty good, so let's put that in there. I don't know if I can name ten <laughs> movies with Roger Moore. Well, that's gonna be the next countdown. All right. is Roger Moore. Um, We're gonna end up watching some weird shit. I mean, we already have. I mean, we watched Repo Man last week. and <laughs> God help us. God, that was such a great movie. I hope we do an episode about that one day, because I really want to jump into that movie. I, I loved it. I, I fucking love that movie. <laughs> Four and a half out of five. You, you, that's how much I love that movie. Wow. Well, everybody seems to agree with you. It's got, what, like a 98 on Rotten Tomatoes or something? Yeah, it's Bullshit incredible. Like I was expecting people just to take like this massive dump on it, and they were just like... No, we like this movie. And I was like, say what? The, I guess more people are following my my lead that Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. And people were recognizing it then and they're recognizing it now. And you know what? Good for you people being enlightened. 666, Ronald Wilson Reagan. I have to say this every episode. Well, the good thing is that we're staying on topic. <laughs> like we always do <laughs> for every episode. All right, whose list is going first? I think you should start. I think you should just name one movie and we'll talk about it. And I'll even say, yes, it was on my list, or no, it was not. Okay, well, number 10, 1970, The Molly Maguires. Oh, I love this one off my list. I thought you would. It I, seems to me you weren't that impressed with it. I, I liked it. I liked hmm. the movie. I think he did an incredible job at it. The problem with the movie is I don't even think Mr. Connery helped it that the movie is very slow plotting for general audiences. Hmm. It's, it's a tough one to swallow at times. Very slow pacing. Kind of picks up, and then it just just falls right back into the slow pacing again. I Overall, I like the movie. I think it's pretty good. I left it off the list, though. Like, it was on my consideration. Hmm. But ultimately, I had to leave it off the list there. I didn't think you'd pick it. I, I mean, I've got it at 10th place. It's. It, I think you should watch it at least once, if you're out there and you're mm-hmm. an economy fan. Um, so, what was, let's, I guess we could say, what, what's the movie about? It's about... It's actually a true story. It's based on this detective uh irish american detective and he and he moved into a small town in pennsylvania where the whole population was basically irish Mm -hmm. and there was some sort of underground crime ring happening because they were sabotaging trains and depots and things like that and they were uh usually using dynamite and so detective james mcparlin uh or known as mckenna when he was undercover, played by the great Richard Harris, <laughs> uh, he goes undercover and kind of wins the trust of the of the coal miners in this town. Mm-hmm. And then he finds out which ones are the criminals and, and kind of one by one turns them into the law. And then they find out that he's, you know, an imposter. And it, and it basically comes to a head between him and, and Sean Connery's character, um, Jack Kehoe. And uh, there's, a, there's a final kind of verbal showdown in the jail cell which i think is a really good ending to the movie mm-hmm. it might be slow but it's got some great uh great acting moments i i just think it's it's a real pleasure to see two of my my all-time favorite actors kind of square off against each other and and uh, i think they had a lot in common as performers as in their background in their style and uh, it, it, evidently they ended up being pretty pretty good friends which i just think is heartwarming so yeah it's very cool to watch harris and connery together uh, match made in heaven. I wish they'd made you know twenty movies together, but unfortunately they only made two. But all in all, it's it is a very slow paced movie. It's very serious. It's about social issues, but um, worth watching just for the performances. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, definitely worth watching once. Like I said, it's a very slow plotting movie. It's not a movie I would recommend to anybody. Just be like, oh, let's watch some Molly McGuire's on this one. Hmm. Um, but no, overall, I liked it. It was fine. I mean, the first time I watched it was with you and. It wasn't too bad right there. When you said Sean Connery and Richard Harris, I'm like, all right. <laughs> Question, do you think Sean Connery would have been awesome in Orca the Killer Whale? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I just wanted to ask you that question because I'm like, wow, that would have been great. That's something the kids out there might not know about. Oh, Orca, Orca the Killer Whale with Richard Harris watching That's one That's awesome. Day. It's Jaws, but instead of a shark, it's a whale. Yeah. And there's icebergs involved, and the Titanic isn't involved, and there's people's hands getting bitten off. It's a great movie. Watch it one day. Sean Connery would have made it even better, but you know what? Beggars can't be choosers. Correct. Mm-hmm. I had a feeling you were going to put this down here. I had a feeling you were going to put that movie down. So good. Okay. Good. Um, all right. I'll start off with this movie. I'm going to just really... I, I can't believe I put this movie down because 
this movie, I think overall is complete shit. Oh. But I think Sean Connery did a really good job at his role, and that's The Rock. Oh. I hate Michael Bay, as you know. Hmm. And the movie is about these, um, this group of, I think they're like former, um, I won't say like CIA agents, but some kind of like special forces group that uh, take over Alcatraz. And they basically want their demands met. And they basically, and basically they're, even though they're played as the bad guys, they, they're kind of like the good guys because they just want their soldiers to be taken care of after, you know, they came home from war. So they, they mm. kind of take, they, they steal this biological weapon and they're going to release it. Even though they had no intentions, all they wanted was just to be recognized and get their benefits and go home and everybody have a good night. But the, the United States government, you know, doing what they do always with our veterans and stuff like that, decides, no, 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 no. So they send these two special guys, Nicholas, Nicholas Cage and Sean Connery, to infiltrate into Alcatraz, take the bioweapon back and, you know, take care of Ed Harris and his group of, as they call, terrorists. Even though there's these bunch of special forces guys, and they just want to be recognized and they want to be taken care of and that's it. So that's what the whole movie is about. Pretty action-packed, a lot of explosions. It's Michael Bay, but Sean Connery is just amazing in this film. So you rank this one based on his performance? His performance than, okay. only. The movie, I would not makes sense. Like if you, if there is this movie right here, if there is nothing on TV, if there is nothing on any of the streaming <laughs> channels at all, and you're just bored out of your mind, but you want to watch a movie, but you don't know what to choose, this is the only time I would recommend this movie. Other than that, if you never see this movie in your life. You'll be okay. It came out in, uh, I want to say, 96, 96, 97. Something like, it's late late 90s, yeah. yeah. Sean Connery is absolutely great. Ed, Ed, and I'll give Ed Harris credit, too. I think Ed Harris does a fine job as the, quote, villain. He is very movie. good in that. Yeah. And so they do a good job. I mean, Sean Connery is still, like, you know, he's getting up in age, but he's still, you know, he's still with it. He's he, about seven years out of uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So he looks really good, too, for his age in that movie, too. It looked like he... He kind of worked out a little bit, you know. He still has the the sharp skills of his acting. You know, he's he's a badass in this movie too. And he's got that witty sense of humor as well, and he's just he's fantastic in this movie. The rest of the movie is crap, though. I have to say, I mean, it is Michael Bay, but all in it's all, it's the better of his films. It, <laughs> but that's not saying much. No, it's not. But I, I overall, I, as a as an action movie, I think it's enjoyable. It's not. It didn't make my top ten. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's it's not my favorite action movies, but it, it is it is what it is. I think it's fun. Yeah, and it's one of those that maybe maybe wouldn't be as great as it is if it didn't have Sean. But that's just how it works. Yeah, I mean, oh, he, the, he makes everything better. Yeah, this movie would have been so much worse without him. It really would. I, I actually would have liked seeing Sean Connery um, in Ed Harris's role. Rather, I think that oh, would yeah. have been, I think that would have been even more interesting. Mm. Hmm. Then again, he has played a role similar to that, but we'll see if that makes one of our lists here. Very interesting. Okay, what do you got next? Okay, ninth place on my list is Robin and Marion. I had that on my list. Did too. you now? I did. I Go had ahead. that on my list. I wrote that down as uh, number seven for me. Wow. Even though I really didn't give any of these much rank except for number one, but that was on my list too. Okay. And that is one of the movies I said... Actually, I think I had... No, that was one of the movies I said, no, you would not put that on there. Well, I did. You did. <laughs> you did. I didn't I didn't know you'd ever seen it. I think you... Not, no, no, we didn't watch it together, but I did... I think I probably watched it over one of the breaks. Hmm. Um, first time I watched it. It was really good. It came out in the late 70s, you know. I mean... How many times have we seen so many adaptations of the same Robin Hood story over and over? Uh, about a dozen, I would but, say. About uh, one too many, um, I would say. But, you know, this one had a different take on the Robin Hood kind of story. And, you know, it does show Robin Hood much older. I mean, it's Sean Connery, so mm. he was losing his hair by then. So maybe after doing Zardoz, maybe that's what happened. <laughs> the, the great thing about Sean is he existed outside of time. Because he was about 45 in this movie, but he looked more like he was 65. Yeah, So I he, know. Could, he could easily play an old man, but with the energy of somebody half the age. Mm -hmm. And just, I don't know. He some, I think he was a perfect Robin Hood. Story. Something not human about the man. Yeah, he was a perfect Robin Hood. But yeah, this is, a, this is another one that's... If I watch it with people, as I've done a couple times, mm -hmm. they always tell me that it's really slow. And, okay. you know... Uh, 
I guess I'm just going to have to concede to that. I don't find it that bad. I mean, I mean the, the biggest thing I love about it is it's got one of the best casts that ever was put together for a movie. So it's, it is about Robin Hood as an older man, uh, comes back from the Crusades, reunites with Marion, fights the sheriff one last time. Uh, so some, some familiarity to the story. But it's also about him as a, as a, as a much older guy with more regrets, more frailties... Um, a, a little vulnerable side that we get to see to Sean that's that's kind of rare to see in his movies. I think he's a, it's an amazing performance by him and by the great Audrey Hepburn mm -hmm. as Marion. The great Richard Harris as King Richard the Lionheart. And of course, Robert Shaw as the Sheriff of Nottingham. Uh, um, Robert Shaw, I have a feeling we're going to be going to another movie. Uh, he might return. Yeah, he might return soon. Anyway, um, just an in incredible choice of actors to play these parts. And I'm kind of shocked that they all came together to do this. But uh, Richard Lester directed it, who had done the movies with the Beatles, A Hard Day's Night and Help. Mm -hmm. And then he did the, the Three Musketeers movies, which, if anybody hasn't seen, I recommend. I think they're a whole lot of fun. And then uh, a slightly later, 1976, he does Robin and Marion with this, like, not quite all-star cast, but this very sturdy British uh, starting lineup of, of people famous for for doing serious work mm -hmm. and uh yeah it's it, so it does kind of play out more like a shakespeare play than like you know an exciting errol flynn type of robin hood movie yeah. but i think it has a lot of maturity i think it's 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 a smart interesting heartfelt movie if you want to watch something with your mom or your grandma this is a pretty good one it's a pretty good one too and like you said it's kind of like robin hood's last run kind of his last hurrah yeah i guess which was a new take on robin hood in some yeah. ways and you know, I you know I enjoy Robin Hood a lot more than I enjoy kind of the action-packed, non-stop Ridley Scott type of thing. Mm. You know, that's just me. I, I think Robin Hood just kind of that's just we don't need like action-packed battle sequences for Robin Hood. It's just guy steals money from the rich, gives it to the poor. We don't we don't need. You know, it's it's really about the characters in the forest rather than just yeah. the battles and. And everything I, and I agree that I, I couldn't I couldn't put this movie off the list. Hmm. I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. First time yeah, I watched it, I really enjoyed it. And you know what? I'm not the biggest Robin Hood fan, but this one I really got behind. Yeah, I think it's pretty mm -hmm. enjoyable. I have to say there are a pretty a couple of pretty cool fight scenes. Mm -hmm. The whole movie's not about that, but mm -hmm. you still get a little action in there. Yeah. Well, speaking cool. of action, I guess I'll name one off the list, and I'm pretty sure you and I both have this movie on the list. Highlander. Well, I'm not gonna give away any spoilers. So continue. Highlight, yeah, Highlander. <laughs> um, I put this on the list. You know, number was, nine for you? Uh, was it number nine? I actually just randomly grabbed this one out. Oh, well, what the hell? Well, I like I said, I had all of them except one. Oh, okay. Ranked on there. So High, Highlander. This was this was on my list. It's just it's a fantastic action movie. And uh, it came out what eighty six? Nineteen eighty six. Yeah, yes. eighty six. Uh, so you know, basically, the movie result um, revolves around all these immortals killing each other until there can, as the quote says, there can only be one, but they would go into these sword fights and they'd behead each other. Supposedly, the story goes is that once you behead all the Highlanders, you gain, like, this enormous absolute power and knowledge of all. Yes. And that's how the story goes. And so Sean Connery plays the kind of the protege to the main character that's played by Christopher Lambert on that, and he plays, <laughs> he plays this Spanish, like conquistador or like swordsman and Juan Sanchez Villalobos oh, Ramirez <laughs> oh my god so this dude you, you can clearly you know like you can hear his Scottish accent through what he was trying to make it as a Spanish accent and to me that's just like how it sounds is fucking charming <laughs> I can't help it like this is I don't know whether I hate this or really love this I think I really love this and I, only Sean Connery can pull it off and his costume, his costume looks absolutely ridiculous, <laughs> and I can't help but say to myself, "Only this man could pull it off wearing it." Like it's amazing, and he still looks the same. He still looks like he's eighty-five years old, yeah, in like in the soul of a forty-five-year-old man. And he's teaching, and you know, he plays kind of the wisdom, the man who's trying to teach the young guy. You know, don't get too eager, don't get too aggressive. You know, patience and time. He plays the mentor, and. 
God, he's fucking great in this. Like, he's just... And, you know, the great thing about this is, is, like, he only appears... He, you know, he's like the Godzilla in this movie. He only appears for, like, eight minutes. But he got top billing, of course. He yeah. Got, like, top billing of that. He, he does disappear, like, halfway through, and then he gets the final kind of voiceover at the end. Yeah, so he appears, what, maybe eight to ten minutes? If you is it really that? Market. God, it, it might be that little. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really short on time. Huh. But, like, he makes the count. And, yeah. like... You, I think most importantly, you walk away from that movie the most talking about Sean Connery, who was in 10 minutes of the movie, of an hour and 45 minute movie. And yet he leaves his mark. That right there, very few actors can pull off in any movie. Yeah, def in any I, movie. I definitely think he makes the biggest impression yeah, of anybody. He makes the biggest impression, makes the biggest impact of that movie. And the movie's not about him. He kind of, he has a back roll seat to it. He helps mold the main character, but you become more attached to Sean Connery's character. Yeah. And you remember his appearances more than you do probably remember, you know, Christopher Lambert or Clancy Brown's character in that movie. So it's, it's I love Highlander. We won't talk about the other movies. Okay. <laughs> on that, but I, like, that's, I think that's like the prime example of how good Sean Connery is. He was yeah. in a movie for a little amount of time. Very little. And yet he made the biggest impact of the whole movie. And the movie's good overall. Even if he took Sean Connery out of the movie, the movie's still fine. Yeah. He, just, he just elevated it even better. Because a lot of people, when I talk about Highlander, you know, with people, you know, obviously they, they mention, you know, oh, there can only be one. I'm like, ah, ha, ha, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what else is the <laughs> one, one of the first things they mention is, oh, Sean Connery's in it. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. For 10 minutes of the movie. I never even thought about that until you said it. Yeah, I mean, seriously. I've always thought about it as we'll a major watch, part of it. Yeah, we'll watch it again. With a we'll stopwatch? Just, yeah, just put like a stopwatch or just like kind of just make a mental note. Like, wow, shit, dude. Like, think about it. You had the flashbacks when he was training, mm -hmm. Christopher Lambert, and then you have the voiceover. What else? That's it. He's not in modern day New York City. No. And most of the movie takes place in modern day New York City. Hmm. So, yeah, there you go. Well, I'll be a son of a bitch. Yeah. And you probably made top money on that, too. But oh, you know, just sure. Sean Connery. He deserved it. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Ten minutes. Best actor of the whole movie. Spanish, Scottish accent. Love it. <laughs> That's all I have to say for that one. Okay. What, what, did you have that on your list? I said I'm not going to spoil anything. Oh, you son of a bitch. All right, what's <laughs> next for you? Next up is Eighth Place. From Russia with Love. Wow. Wow. I had that on my list as I well. I thought you might have. Eighth place, huh? Interesting. Well, I know you're going to be upset about some of these placements, but I had, ah, it's fine. I had to do what I had to do. Well, no, you're going to say, I'm not going to spoil it for you, so I can't <laughs> ask you my follow-up question. Now, but go on. No, you can't. You have to wait. Well, Robert Shaw makes another Robert appearance. Robert Shaw is back wow. with us again, and in, I mean, in terms of ranking these movies based on how much I love them, um, the biggest thing you have to say is Robert Shaw... Greatest Bond villain that ever was or ever will be, in my opinion. Mm. <laughs> well, moving on. Top five. Put him in top okay. Five. All right. It's not the one with like. Well, it's very early. It's second second movie in the James Bond series. If you don't uh, count Casino Royale, yeah. Well, right. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it's before a lot of the traditions got started. So it doesn't even have the Aston Martin. It doesn't have as many beautiful goyles and and uh, explosions and things. Very few gadgets, yeah. Yeah, but I, but I do think it's a really solid watch from start to finish. And there's beautiful locations and and you know uh, takes place on a train. Like there's a lot of stuff on a train. There's a, a but, lot of you know, stuff on a train. But that's uh, there might not be the last time. That's how they do a train. That's how they do things in Europe. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the big for me the biggest centerpiece to it is the. Uh, confrontation in the train between sean connery and robert shaw as mr grant yeah i think who, what's what's one of the most interesting and in things about this movie and you don't really see it with many bond movies there's there's a couple but not as good as this is the interaction between robert shaw and sean connery robert shaw is basically stalking him hmm. because you know he was hired to kill him and you know you see the scene in the beginning where you know, they did all the um, the Sean Connery lookalikes, and they're in the training seminar in the in the um, the garden maze, the labyrinth. And Robert Shaw basically kills all of them, so he's basically training. He's hired in by Spectre to go in and just kill him. 
So he's like, you know, he's seeking out his prey, he's getting to know his prey, and just the dialogue interaction between the two of them is just fantastic in this movie. It's mm. it's the best interaction between a villain and James Bond in any Bond movie, I think. That one I could place number one for sure. I guess sure. we'll settle on that then. Yeah, that one, and, and that one I can definitely agree with. Um, no disrespect to Mr. Seen Bean on that, but <laughs> I, it's just, the, you won't find that in any other Bond movie right now, and... I think that's something that kind of lacks in 007 movies nowadays and something that's lacked for for a long time too. But this one right here, it was, it was perfect. It was, it was perfect. And this movie overall for Bonds, it ranks in my top five, probably top three. I would say. Yeah, I think I'd be with you. Yeah. It's just, it's, and Sean Connery once I think Dr. No put him on the map for like mainstream audiences but i think from russia would love really put him in the echelons of like okay we have our bond yeah because i know ian fleming he didn't want sean connery as james bond because he wasn't english he was scottish but then after he saw his performances he realized nope this is the perfect guy right here and i think this movie just helps him confirm that a bit more that is i i'd forgotten to i'd forgotten to mention that but yeah he was a very controversial choice mm -hmm. because uh a fleming thought of him as this like inarticulate big burly football playing kind of guy and he you know he won't have any kind of sophistication he won't know what drinks to order at a bar or whatever you know to be suave and cool and classy like james bond and yet he you know with, with study and dedication he managed to to play the part exactly right and from what i've read uh at at the very end ian fleming admitted that he was the right guy and, and, and gave him his blessing yeah so yeah i mean i i have no disagreements about this movie it's it's just it's it's wonderful and i and i do miss like sometimes like i know the appeal of james bond is you know the gadgets and just you know violence and all that but you know this movie most of that is gone it really depends on who the actor is and sean connor yeah. carry that really well i don't know to be honest, I don't know if any of the other Bond actors could have pulled this off. No, maybe that's why I like it so much. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is missing a lot of that stuff that we all love, but uh, you also get to see him solve the case, uh, you know, with his brain. It's kind mm -hmm. of more like a detective story. Yeah, it's, so. it's the only time we kind of see James Bond as a detective more than, a, you know, a secret spy. Yeah. It's some, which, you know, in ways, secret spies are detectives. They're just secret. Exactly. So, you know, no, that's on my list. I, I can't disagree with that. And if I may introduce one final trivia mm -hmm. question. This is the movie that introduced him to his lifelong love of golf, which he learned from his co-star, Robert Shaw, when they were <laughs> bored in between <laughs> takes. And oh. I just think that's maybe my favorite fact ever. Oh, and <laughs> so while we're on the subject of golf, I might as well segue into another movie. That I have on here that involves a little bit of golf, and that's Goldfinger. I knew it would be there. And Goldfinger, yeah. I... Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. We're going to get sued for that. Oh, I know. <laughs> Goldfinger is going to come back, and he's going to paint his gold. <laughs> um, once again, Sean Connery comes back. This is the third Bond movie, mm. and he just... The gadgets are, are back, and you know now, you, now we're getting back into the era of what would become modern-day Bond, but... Sure. He carries us in there, and I think he's, once again, he's just fucking fantastic. He's, his dialogue in this movie is just so witty and so clever. Yeah, I think Goldfinger was the right movie to make as the third one in the series, because From Russia With Love was, was a pretty serious, pretty hard-hitting mm -hmm. action movie. And Goldfinger was like, what if we just made, you know, something totally off the wall? What if we throw in all the jokes and, and cars and gadgets and beautiful babes and everything you can think of? It's like, this one is a lot more fun. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. The golf scene is what I'm thinking of, of how witty he got in this movie where he kind of just fooled him by finding a different ball, finding out Goldfinger cheated, and he kind of just rubbed it in his face and got him disqualified on purpose and he played it off so coolly just like oh, yeah yeah in the <laughs> in the 21st century you'll never have a movie where where you beat the villain by substituting a golf ball but he did it <laughs> he fucking did it and i do love that just crushes the ball in his bare hands he just gives it back to him and he just kind of like drops it just like oh my and we should spend a moment to talk about oddball or Odd Job. Right? Odd Job, yeah. Oddball is Donald Sutherland <laughs> yeah. and Kelly's heroes. Odd Job is who I'm thinking of. Oh, man. 
I think he was a professional wrestler in Japan. I, I think so, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, he just, um, he killed people with his hat. I yes, mean, this, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, there's really not, like, the dude literally took off his hat, threw like a frisbee, and then sliced that statue's head off. Yeah. How fucking awesome is that? Well, it's... I miss that kind of shit. That's the kind <laughs> of bullshit I want to see in movies. Yeah, no No kidding. more Michael Bay explosions. No more lightsabers. Just give me somebody who takes off a hat and just throws it and slices people. Hmm. That's what I want in my movies now. I want bullshit like that. And not to spoil anything, but also when it gets stuck in between the bars and they electrocute him. Oh, yeah. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is better than that. Oh, it's great. Well, one thing is better than that, which is the idea that they're going to irradiate all the gold in Fort Knox <laughs> so that they have to buy money from Dr. Goldfinger. <laughs> I will destroy the United States he economy. Hire, I think he was he got hired by the Chinese government to do that. I think that's how it went in the Whatever. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> Something like, so Mao Zedong's so desperate for money. It's just, you realize you're going to owe this man more money that you don't even have? Doesn't matter. Oh, oh, I'm put. My name is Pussy Galore. Oh, I must be dreaming. My, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm hoping he just won off that. He just like he, he forgot his lines. I'm like, I must be dreaming. That is great. My favorite thing is when he tells Goldfinger how many millions of innocent people will die, and he says, "American motorists kill twice that many in a year." <laughs> Oh, man, leave it to realism for yeah. James Bond movies. Yeah, the Goldfinger's in my top five. I knew it would be. Yeah, and, and, and It's a gem, that's for sure. It, it is. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a golden gem. Indeed. <laughs> it is. It's, it's a great movie. And Sean Connery, once again, like I said, like there's there's certain actors you know who just couldn't pull this role off. Like, if, I, if, I had, if we had put Daniel Craig or Pierce Brosnan or Timothy Dalton... In Goldfinger, I don't know if Goldfinger would be that successful, or we would enjoy it as much. No, it 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 takes really a one of a kind person to do it, which is why we're doing a whole tribute episode yeah. about him. But I mean, the dude yeah. looks fucking great playing golf. Like, can yeah. we ask for more? Yeah, he, he he somehow seems like a guy who knows the rules of every sport and knows what fancy drink to order. To you know, mm -hmm. uh, in social situations, and and can be that you know refined Englishman. But also looks like somebody who would beat you into a bloody pulp, you know, <laughs> I mean, the with first no thing, effort. The first thing he showed us that when he goes back to his hotel room and the girl is there and then he's just like, all right. And then, he, you know, the guy comes in, he breaks in and he electrocutes him and he beats up the girl because she tries to kill him. And, you know, he says something when he like, consider this our last date or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a great movie. I, I totally... If, even if you didn't get into James Bond, if you're not a James Bond fan, definitely check out the last two James Bond movies we mentioned. From Russia with Love and Goldfinger, it's, it's great. Yeah, those are about as great as you can get. Yeah, and, and you know, I didn't, I didn't, well, you might have this one on your, on your list, so I might want to hold my opinion about a recommendation later on, but go for it. Okay, well that brings us to seventh place, and things get a little lighter, because I put Darby O'Gill and the Little People at number seven on I my list. I have not seen this movie, oh, so... You well, I was about to say, you'll love it. <laughs> I don't know if you will. All right. I personally do. Um, this is the oldest one I have on my list. 1959, mm -hmm. this came out. And there's a, there's actually a kind of a pub brawl scene toward the end. <laughs> and the producers who are watching it were thinking about making a James Bond movie series. And that's that scene is what convinced them that this would be the right guy. Okay. So it's very early in his career. It was the first time I think his name was anywhere close to the title of the movie. He's like the fourth most important character. Uh, it's not very clear what the setting is in terms of time, but probably somewhere in the 19th century. And it's in a small town in Ireland. Uh, so it's, it's meant to evoke the olden days. And it's uh, about a little old Irish gentleman, Darby O'Gill, played by Albert Sharp, who is basically the local town drunk. And he has this long-standing kind of like rivalry with Brian, the king of the leprechauns, uh, and it's about who not only not only which one can outdrink the other, but who's cleverer, who writes better poems, all these. So you before know. you go on, in my mind right now, I am picturing like kid drawings of a leprechaun who has a king crown, and on the other hand, on the other side is the town hobo. Yeah. 
Oh, this is fantastic. It's, Why haven't I seen this I, yet? Only you know the answer to that. Um, so it's... <laughs> so it's Disney. It's the complete opposite of something like The Rock, I guess. But it's uh, but it's this it's this really enjoyable movie. It's just sweet and innocent. It's about uh, trying to get one over on the on the King of the Leprechaun so he can get his three wishes and so his the, and his pot so of gold. So the Mickey Mouse ears are in Ireland now. They they're the reason for all the potato famine. Correct. Oh, I knew it. I knew this was. I knew I knew Disney was involved. Somehow. Nothing is safe. Oh. Uh, Steamboat Willie, you strike again. Nothing is safe. Best. So it's it's very sweet, very charming. It's a you know movie you can watch with your kids probably. Okay. Uh, and and Sean plays this character who is new in town and gets hired to work the fields. Uh, and of course, he doesn't believe in the leprechauns, the little people, uh, until <laughs> uh, until Darby wins him over to his way of thinking. Uh, the little people. The little people, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know the answer to this, but I'm kind of hoping you tell me in some kind of screwed up time warp way that Warwick Davis is in this movie. I don't think he'd even been born yet. I know, but I'm just hoping you say this and you reality you're telling me, oh, he's really like 92 years old and he's still <laughs> kicking it well. Damn it. There's leprechauns here? That, that wasn't a metaphor? This is the real deal. Real leprechaun. No, it's not a metaphor. What the <laughs> hell are you talking about? <laughs> so when you first mentioned to me about leprechauns, I'm like, okay, what kind of fucking metaphor is oh, this? Oh, I see. And then you're like, Disney, I'm like, oh, this isn't a metaphor. This <laughs> no, is real leprechauns. A, what the hell? There's the town drunk, the kid of the leprechauns, four-leaf clovers, and pots of golds at the end of the rainbow, yeah. and lucky charms. Oh, yeah. That's oh, all. That's the all biggest right stereotypes it. of all of Ireland, and yes. I love it. It's, it's wonderful. Oh, it's great. I got nothing bad to say about it. So why didn't Sean believe in that? He was, he was a realist. He's just like, leprechauns ain't fucking real. I've never found pots of gold. Well, you know, he's from that generation. He's a youngster. He Is doesn't... he playing golf in this movie? No, because he hadn't met Robert Shaw just yet. I see. Damn but he see. does get a musical number. Ooh, okay. And maybe I shouldn't spoil anything else. Okay. Yeah, you got my vote to watch this movie. It's great. I mean, I, I obviously it's in my top ten. So, wow. you know. I, um... So you go. <laughs> um... Ooh. Alright. Murder on the Orient Express. That's what I have next. Okay. The Agatha Christie adaptation. Okay, so the, how many... Out of all the Agatha Christie adaptation from her books that became movies, this is probably the one that gets done the most. At least the yeah. one I can think of the most. It's basically her version of The Hound of the Baskervilles. Yeah. So basically, they're on a train... There's a murder that happens, and he try to find out who the killer is. Hercule Poirot is on the train, so he tries to solve the murder on who murdered this person on the train. And there's many suspects. I think there's, like, close to, like, I can't even think of it off the time. I have, like, eight, eight or nine suspects, maybe ten. The whole, Yeah, the whole cast is, like, 20, 25 people. Yeah. And several of them are married couples, so they're, like... Yeah. They're like a suspect, but together. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that you know, basically, it's your typical murder mystery on who who done it. It's a who done it mo uh, movie, and Sean Connery plays the Colonel, I believe. Colonel Buffnut. <laughs> Try saying that five times <laughs> as fast. And once again, he's. Do I need to say anything more? He plays a Colonel. Plays a Scottish uh, infantry a Colonel. Scottish infantry. Colonel. Who's whose girlfriend is the very beautiful Jacqueline Bisset. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing more I need to say other than Sean Connery. Oh, no, I said that wrong. Huh? No, he he and Vanessa Redgrave are a pair. Are they? And Jacqueline Bissett is Michael York's girlfriend. Oh, right, right. Oh, it's a big Michael, cast. I forgot Michael York. Yeah, th this is like an all-star cast. Which, yeah, it's pretty incredible. Which is like that for every Murder on the Orient Express movie there is. They always have to have an all-star cast or close to an all-star cast. But this one right here, it's your typical, it came out in the 70s, so you're looking at, you know, your typical 50s to 70s all-star cast. If you have it, Sean Connery's in it, it's Colonel, and it's it's the best adaptation of this movie. Um, and it's a, I highly recommend it. This is the, if you're going to watch an adaptation of Murder on the Orient Express, this is the one you have to watch. You have Anthony Perkins that was also in this Anthony, movie. Yes, too. I forgot him. Albert Finney as our um, lead... Okay, I'll no, wow. Oh, Finney was great at, at that role. He really was. He was great. 
Oh, Ingrid Bergman is also in this movie. I was going to say that, but I, I thought maybe I was getting her yep. confused with somebody else. Yeah, Vanessa Redgrave, yep. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's an all-star cast. Lauren Bacall's in it, too? Yeah, I forgot her. Oh, holy shit. God, it's been so long since I've seen it. Um, yeah, and they did clearly $1.4 million for their budget. Box office, they raked in close to $36 million. Pretty good. And it received six nominations for the Academy Awards. And Finney got nominated for Best Actor. Wow. Yeah. So you'd say this is one of his finest performances? I think so. I mean, it's just... it's. I just think it's that great. Hmm. I think he does a fantastic job. It's certainly... For, for a, a movie that's very enclosed in space, hmm. and you get to see the characters nonstop, I think he's a perfect character to just put in that slot... Because you're not, you don't have much wiggle room to play with, with this type of movie. You're, I mean, yeah. there's only one setting. You're on a train. That's yeah. it. There's nothing. There's nothing else involved with that. So I think he just. I think he certainly adds to the charisma of this all-star cast. Even if he, I, I'm sure if he took Sean Connery out and put him, you know, replaced him with something, the movie would have been fine. But I think he just makes it that better. Yeah, he he, he was um, like. Able to take over the entire movie, like in Highlander, mm -hmm. but also able to somehow thrive amongst a huge cast of, yeah. of characters. Yeah, so now we, we have an example of a movie where, like, you have just, like, a plethora of just an all-star crew. Pretty much, you put Albert Finney, you take Warren Bacall, any one of those people could just carry a movie on their own. Mm -hmm. But to work with all those personas, that's a different story. Sometimes yeah. it, it sometimes it doesn't go as planned where one outshines the other or one kind of unbalances the movie because of the other one. So I think it's just I think it's just well done acting by everybody and Sean Connery especially in this movie. It's a it's a funny thing. Several of the of the ones we've talked about and are going to talk about are mm -hmm. just like packed to the gills with great actors. Agreed. Somehow he just was never intimidated by that. He was just so self assured, just so comfortable in himself that that you know. His presence wouldn't go unnoticed, no matter no matter whom else was around him. That's just the kind of quality he had. Yeah, I mean, it's a great movie. It is People, a great movie. Yeah, give, give it. It's been a long time since I've watched it, though, so I would like to revisit that one day. I mean, I love Agatha Christie books. And, I know you do. And Hercule Poirot is my favorite detective. So, all right, what do you got next? Next up, we're at sixth place, and that brings us to Time Bandits. <laughs> I knew you were going to put this out here. I, I left this one off because I was thinking of performances. Mm. If we were thinking of straight movies, definitely Time Bandits would have been on this on this list. This is the only one where I didn't know where to put it. It's, a, I, it's a tough one, yeah. Because I absolutely love the movie. But th there's five other just like solid gold ones <laughs> that I needed to get to. Mm -hmm. So I put it in sixth place just because I think uh, it's, it's kind of underrated. Um People seem to know about it, but it's never in, like, anybody's list of the greatest fantasy movies or whatever. Um, greatest 80s movies. Both of which I think it deserves to be. It just gets a little bit swept past. And it's, of everything on my list, he plays the smallest part, I think, in Time Bandits. So maybe that's why it's in sixth place for me. Okay. So it's about this... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> good, good luck trying to describe good luck. this. Uh, it's about these six gentlemen... Who, what they are exactly is not exactly ever confirmed, but they work for the Supreme Being, uh, designing parts of the universe, <laughs> uh, and their specialty is is trees and shrubs and greenery, and they designed the Pink Bunkadoo, which is the greatest tree that ever existed, um, and they somehow snatch a young boy out of his bedroom thinking that he was someone else, uh, but then he goes along with them through their adventures through all the holes in space and time and they have this uh map that shows them basically the layout of the universe and they can see where there are punctures in it and you can go through those as like wormholes and it'll get you back to the time of napoleon or robin hood mm -hmm. or in this case king agamemnon of ancient greece played by sir sean connery um and there's a famous anecdote about this that in the script it gets to the part where so the little boy gets separated from the bandits and he meets up with this guy who's wearing a helmet and fighting somebody who has the head of a bull 
because it's ancient Greece and shit like that was happening. In the script, there's a part that says uh, he removes his helmet and reveals Sean Connery or someone of equal but cheaper stature. And uh, they put that in there just as a stage direction. But somebody passed the script on to Sean and he thought that was so funny that he said, I'll do it. Uh, so he, he once again gets probably five minutes worth of the movie. Yeah, five, ten minutes at most. But he he again plays somebody in like a pink toga with ringlets in his hair mm -hmm. and, and, and gold chains and things to look like a like an ancient emperor. And no no sign that he feels silly at all. He just totally totally inhabits that. And I think that's the that's the key to becoming Sean Connery. Never feel any shame <laughs> about anything. So of course he gets he gets uh duped by the bandits and they take all his gold and then disappear and go into another time and i think they end up on the titanic after they leave him uh if i remember my chronology correctly You're but that's correct. that's after they've already robbed from uh robin hood played by john cleese which is a wonderful scene mm -hmm. and the emperor napoleon played by sir ian holm another movie with an awesome cast um it's just as hard as it is for me to describe just I mean, that's imagine, Terry Gilliam for you. Yes. Terry Gilliam, yes, who directed and wrote the movie. Mm -hmm. um, just imagine you know, the weirdest... You know, I will say, Time Bandits, out of all the movies I've ever seen in my life, if you gave me a... If we did a countdown of the top ten best endings to a movie, Time Bandits has to be <laughs> in that list. Like, I, the first time I watched Time Bandits was with you. Oh. And when I saw the ending, I laughed so hard that I could <laughs> not believe... Like, wow, this is where the movie's going to end? This is perfect. Yeah. This is exactly how I wanted it to end. Those were the good old days, weren't oh, they? Oh, man, that's just, oh, that's, just what I, that's just what I needed. Yeah, this cast in this movie is just absolutely incredible. Hmm. It's such an entertaining movie. There's not a single second in this movie that isn't entertaining. Not one second. No. It's perfect. I, I, think, it's, I think it's better than any of the Monty Python movies. Wow. I think it's... I, 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 that's how highly I think of Time Bandits. Gee. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's Gilliam's finest work. And he's got some good ones, too. He's mm. got some really good stuff. But I think Time Bandits, to me, is my favorite of his. And he had the power to pull all these great actors like Ian Holm and, obviously, our, our boy, Sean Connery, into these movies. And Sean makes the best of his ten minutes worth of fame in here. He's mm. very entertaining, too. He's... Once again, he just, he makes every second count. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't disagree with that. I kind of, I kind of wish I should have, I should have put that on there, but there was a few movies and I'm like, ah. This is torture. I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. So time, many... I love time and it's off my list. I, I couldn't. A lot of things had to get skipped, which I mm -hmm. feel badly about, but maybe we'll come back around to them. I think so. So I'm making an executive decision to... Because I completely forgot about this movie, and now I'm thinking, like, no, it's got to be on here. Hmm. So I'm removing one movie, and I'm going to go with The Untouchables. Okay. I mean, you won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for that movie, too. Sure did. So, um, yeah, The Untouchables. Let's talk about The Untouchables. I, nothing I'd rather do. <laughs> In preparation for this, I, I had an afternoon to myself, so I watched The Untouchables again, uh, which is why my list had to change a little bit. We'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. But um, this... I do just fucking love this movie. I just think it's a really... I, on the one hand, a great story, mm -hmm. beautifully directed by De Palma. I mean, he was a guy with a lot of talent, obviously. Yeah, so the whole, uh, the whole premise of the movie is Elliot Ness is trying to stop Al Capone, played by Robert De Niro, and his gang from... Um, you know, pretty much ruined the town of Chicago and, you know, selling, you know, illegal goods of alcohol during the Prohibition era. Yes. Um, so, of course, the movie, I think the, the movie starts off with, like, some of the best opening five minutes to any movie ever. Are we talking about the little girl? In the, the little girl in the bar going <laughs> off in the candy shop or the yeah. bar or something, yeah. Um, which I think is great, and it's just like a, it's a colorful cast of characters. Um, you got some, some actors like Andy Garcia, um, and the guy who plays Wallace, I can't think of his name off the top Charles of Charles Martin Smith. Yeah, where you're just lesser known actors, but they fit the role nicely. And then sure. you have Kevin Costner, Robert De Niro, and, of course, Sean Connery, who plays Malone, right? Jimmy Malone, yeah, yes. Yeah, Malone, who's this cop who 
Um, the Chicago cop who pretty much walks the streets and he's just your average patrolman. And then he talks with Elliot Ness, who's played by Kevin Costner. And, you know, he's, he's talking to him about trying to bust Capone. And of course, you get the, like, oh, no, you can't do this. Yeah. They're too big for you. And then he's like, okay, are you sure you want to do this? Because once you do it, there is no turning back. I'll just open the fucking door. All right, here we go. So that's how they start. And that's how the whole movie takes off with, you know, Sean Connery kind of like, I think he plays the role of like, okay, he's in the twilight of his days. He just yeah. wants to get through it. And then he's just like, no, this is for the good of the people, good of the law. Let's do this. We'll do whatever it takes. He has probably the best scene in the whole movie. Do you, can you name what scene that is? Is it the one when he picks up the dead man? Yep, where he picks up the dead man. <laughs> Can't you talk with a gun in your mouth? <laughs> and interrogates him even though he's already dead. He blows his brains out in front of the Canadian. Um, or in front of the guy, the, one of the gangsters that they kept alive. Yep. While they were in Canada. I believe that's where they're Yeah, they're going to smuggle across the Canadian border into mm-hmm. Illinois. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the, the one guy that they catch, and he's got a book full of names, and they figure this, maybe we can put the finger on Capone, finally. Uh, but he says, no way in hell am I going to tell you what it says in there. And so... Uh, <laughs> Connery so, picks up the dead guy. So Connery picks up this corpse of a guy he killed earlier, conveniently, and says, I need you to translate this book. <laughs> and so uh, he says, I'll count to three. And when he gets to three... He shoots the dead body in the head and splatters it all over the perfect De Palma moment. It splatters all over the window. And then the guy freaks out and he says, I'll tell you what you want to know. I'll tell you everything. I'll decipher it. Watching it again, I realized it's a very optimistic movie, which I think is typical of, of the time it came out in the late 80s. Yeah, but It's the, about you, catching the bad guys and doing what's right. You usually don't see that in gangster movies. Getting these damn drugs off the streets, yeah. or alcohol in this case. <laughs> But it, you know, it's kind of ironic at the end of the movie when, you know, he's they get um they get Capone for tax evasion, yeah. which is how it really happened. They got Capone exactly. for tax evasion, and Kevin Costner walks out on the street, and the reporter stops him, and he's just talking. You know, you're the guy who, you who took out Al Capone. He's just like, eh, you know, we did what we had to do, and then he's just like, well, did you hear? Prohibition is over. They're gonna we're gonna start selling alcohol. And he's like, oh. Maybe I'll have a drink. And I'm just like, okay, so it was all for nothing, really, right? And then they do the music, and... Yeah, yeah, so I was just like, oh, I guess it was all for nothing? That's kind of ironic? Yeah. I mean... It's kind of the perfect way to end the movie. I know how you love the ending of Time Bandits, but that's a pretty great one. Yeah, it is a great one. It's just kind of like... It's kind of just like, wait, what? And then it's over, and, like, I don't think people realize that moment at the end. I'm like, they're basically fighting throughout the whole movie. It all stems from people that are profiting... Of illegal sale of alcohol. Yeah. And so that's where the whole fight is. Like, it, you know, Al Capone, it wasn't just... The reason why Al Capone <laughs> was murdering people was because, like, he was trying to get a monopoly on selling illegal alcohol to people. Right. And if I may do my De Niro. Mm-hmm. And all this talk of bootlegging. What is bootlegging? <laughs> On a boat, it's bootlegging. On Lakeshore <laughs> Drive, it's hospitality. Mm-hmm. One of a great scene in this movie is when he beats the guy senseless with the baseball bat at the <laughs> dinner table. Baseball! How can you not love that? Yeah. It what has... is he? He's a nobody! He can't feel, he can't hit, can't do anything. And then all of a sudden, they're all laughing and he just... <laughs> I mean, the sound effects on that is great, oh, yeah. too. It's just like, you hear it and you're like, oh, shit. Yeah, that's good shit. Yeah. It's It's... And it, another great scene is in the beginning as well when he's getting the shave. And, yeah. like, the barber accidentally cuts him. And you could see, like, the fear in his face. And he's kind of looking at the one guy and the other guy's looking at the other guy. And he's like, no, no, it's all right. It's all right. But you can sense that fear. Like, mm. like you know, like, it's a great villain moment where you know right away this guy is not a guy you want to fuck with. Even, even from the smallest things. Mm. I think that's a great, like, kind of, like, little detail, but the message gets sent across right away. Like, okay, don't fuck with this guy. Yeah, it's, uh, that's a tough one, because all around, excellent script, beautifully directed, <laughs> with the perfect actors in every part. And, and it has to be said, Robert De Niro was born to play Al Capone, and he's never really been able to kind of equal that again, at least in my opinion. I know a lot of people think he's the greatest, but I mean, that's just a part that... He's had some other really good movies, too. I mean, I'll, I'll vouch for Raging Bull. I think that's a fantastic movie. Mm. Uh, but yeah, he, he was really good in this, and, you know, I know we got off topic again, <laughs> but Sean Connery, I mean, he played just, you know, your Midwestern type of, like, 
middle class cop who's just doing his job, patrolling the streets at night. <laughs> what's with the gun? <laughs> I love that part where he stops Kevin Costner so and be like, hey, what's with the gun? So you know, <laughs> that's another subtle like moment where you realize, okay, this guy's a vet, a veteran, you know, he knows. You know, yeah, that's uh, I think that shows the strength of the script because there's a lot of moments when characters just from a little motion or something they notice, you know, and then they know what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's good. It's yeah. great shit. He also gets my favorite line, which is, "You just fulfilled the first rule of law enforcement. <laughs> Make sure when your shift is over, you go home alive." <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's great. That's peak stuff. It's it's got my final comment. It's got uh, an amazing balance between being a really violent movie, but also one that somehow you still feel good about when it's over. Yeah, like they like they got the bad guys. It's yep. great. It's yeah. really fun for for a different thing, but you know they got it. Yeah. So, where does that leave me? Oh, fifth place. <laughs> And this one, we come back to a recurring theme, uh, the Great Train Robbery. <laughs> this is the third time we've talked about trains. Yes. And I regret nothing. Um, this was number one on my list. Really? Jesus. This was number wow. one on my list. This was hard, but I, I decided that the Great Train Robbery was his finest. Huh. Well. I fucking love this movie. I think it has everything you want. In a movie. I, I couldn't quite believe how much you enjoyed it the first time we it's, watched it. It's a fantastic movie. It's, it's great. Um, it's, got, it's got action. It's got... Oh my God, the humor in this movie is just... The best. <laughs> like, I don't know, like, how else to describe this movie. But it's just like... It's a movie... This is a movie where you told me what it was about. And then, like... Obviously, like, I read about it, so I'm like, all right, let's... But then I watched it, and it was, com like, a complete 180. Like, it was not what I was expecting. Oh, so did you think it was going to be kind of boring? I, I thought it was just going to be your standard, like, a standard, like, typical train robbery, you know, mm. setting up, getting the wheels in motion, which it does happen. That's, you know, they plan it out. But the steps they take to try to rob the train <laughs> was something I just wasn't expecting. Mm. And it was just fucking fantastic. I, I have nothing bad to say about this movie at all. Like I, I, I literally have nothing bad about this movie to say. I, I just can't. This is, it's another one where I feel bad about putting it in fifth place because it, you know, it easily could be first. But I had a lot of great ones to get to. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, surprise is probably what everybody experiences when they watch it because it seems like this movie nobody's ever heard of and. And then it turns out to be this phenomenal movie. It's a it's a phenomenal movie. I recommend it to anybody. It's that's how highly I think of this it's great. movie. It is great. Yeah. Um, so go. Like, I guess we should talk about what the movie's about. Well, it's slightly based on a real event, although I think all the characters are made made up for mm -hmm. it, or their names are changed or whatever. So Connery plays Edward Pierce, who is a, a thief. Uh, of great skill and he's basically masquerading as somebody who's high class in London London society uh, but he's just putting on that show because he really wants to get the gold and there's a shipment of gold on a train between London and Folkestone and it's to pay the soldiers of the Crimean War that's their wages mm -hmm. so they have to figure out how to get on board the train how to get into the train compartment how to crack the safe where the gold is, how to remove the gold and replace it in the bags with something of a similar weight, lead bars in this case, uh, get back out and get back into their train car and act like nothing happened. And that takes up about two hours <laughs> worth of planning of the movie. And then the finale is Sean climbing out of his, his train compartment and on foot making it away across the back of the train to the very far to the caboose where the gold is and then lower himself with ropes uh, and get in and all of this he did himself he refused to use a stunt double so you're really seeing Sean the entire time which I think is one of the coolest things I've ever seen yeah um, and then of course he has compatriots he has Donald Sutherland as a as an expert safe cracker and he also um, can steal they have to figure out elaborate ways to steal the keys 
so that he can make impressions of them in a wax palette, basically, and then he can make reproductions of them so they can use the fake keys to get into the safe and grab the gold and make out of there with all the money. And that's the plot, and, <laughs> and the reason it's so fucking great is because they, like, for the entire runtime of the movie, they never run out of, of set pieces, mm -hmm. clever ways of figuring out how to get the how to get the keys, how to get the gold, how to get what they want, how to fool the rich people into giving up their secrets. Um, the 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 exceptional Leslie Ann Down mm -hmm. uh, uses her feminine wiles to lure it out of some of them. And it's it's just it's really charming, funny, entertaining. I think fast paced personally. Um, st story about these scumbags of the criminal underworld who mm -hmm. who you still want to root for just because it's such a huge task that they're ah uh, fuck war give it to the criminals. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a movie that I love to death, and I'd be happy to put it in first place. I just kind of yeah, I can't say anything more about this movie. I really can't. It's it's great. It's great. <laughs> it's, the more the more I thought about his performance in this movie, the more I was just like, I have to put this as number one. Wow. Because I did. also read about the stunt doubling thing. I think mm. that's the only movie I actually read where he actually did his own stunts. Mm. That's pretty high on my list too, and it's just. And you know, there's nothing like there's there's nothing like mind blowing in terms of like special effects or you know choreography of this movie. Like it's it's pretty much what you see is what you get with this movie. But like the simplicity of this movie really makes this movie shine. And once again, Sean Connery being Sean Connery makes it worth it. Yeah, the, I mean the story couldn't be any more straightforward. Yeah, it's I... it's pretty much straightforward. It's just like. Bunch of dudes want 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 to rob a train. I think what what's extraordinary about it is the way they were able to totally recreate the London of eighteen fifty five. Mm -hmm. That's that's just beautifully done. Nobody ever talks about Michael Crichton as one of the great directors, but his work on this movie is just I think exceptional. Yeah, and he also wrote the book on this too. Yeah. I mean, this one's fantastic, and this is a book I've been meaning to grab just to read it and just do. A little bit of comparison, but yeah, I, I, I love this movie. Huh. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy you showed me this movie. This movie well, is great. God bless us all at Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> so looking at my list, there are two movies left that we have not named yet. One of them, I said, yes, you would probably have this on your list. The other one, no. This one is my, if I had, out of the three that we mentioned... That I mentioned to you where I said, no, you won't have this on your list. This one is the one that I absolutely am I close to 100% that you will not have this on your list. And it is? I'm going to leave that one for last. Okay. Uh, next one for me, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Junior! Indiana. <laughs> Junior! Junior! <laughs> India's back. Mm. And what should have been his last <laughs> mission... But, unfortunately, plans change. So, Indiana Jones, once again, those damn Nazis mm. get involved. So, his father, played by Sean Connery, is kidnapped. And so, he goes to find him along with Marcus, goes to find him. And on the way, they find clues because they find out his dad was looking for the Holy Grail. His dad, for his whole life... The literal Holy Grail. Yeah, the literal Holy Grail. <laughs> His whole life had been, like, reading textbooks and writing stories and maps on how to yeah. find the Grail. I mean, he already met the King of the Leprechauns. Mm -hmm. so. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so. It all makes sense now. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I gotta watch that movie. <laughs> You're gonna love it. Oh, I can't wait. So the Nazis kidnap Sean Connery, and eventually Harrison Ford finds him, and they go off, he rescues them out of I think they were kidnapped in Austria or they were held in Austria. Yes. And so they leave and they go back over to the Middle East and they try to discover the Holy Grail. Well, to get out, they have to get out of occupied, Nazi occupied Austria, which yes. is oh my god, that whole sequence is fucking great. First they, they motorcycle their way they, first of all, they motorcycle out of the, out of the castle. They're in like this 
this really just high-end castle. They motorcycle their way out. They get chased on a motorcycle by Nazis. They get out of there, and then they get chased by planes. Nazis in planes. Yes. And, of course, Sean Connery, the only man in the history of movies that has killed a Nazi with the help of seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, the best thing in the, about the whole movie is that noise he makes when he's going to fright. And the seagulls just fly up, and the Nazi goes like, ah! That is a terrible way to go out, but that's what you get when you sell your soul to Adolf Hitler, I guess. And that, kids, is how we won the war. Mm -hmm. That is how we won the war. <laughs> I mean, and then... Harrison, people are trying to kill us. <laughs> Sean Connery says, Junior! Junior! Always calling Indiana Jones by Junior! Junior! Oh my god, you can't get it out of your head. Right. Uh, he had so many great moments in this movie. You know, he he did deserve his Oscar for The Untouchables, but I think he deserved it more for Indiana Jones. Oh, I can't, I can't, like, I agree. He should have been a two-time winner for yeah, this. Yeah, for sure. Even when he gets shot, he's great. He's great for every Just second that he's in. Boy. <laughs> but in the Latin alphabet, Jehovah begins with an I. Jehovah! <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> God, it's great. Oh, it's... We could just reenact the movie. I know, we could but... reenact the whole movie with him. Well, what are you sitting around here for? Well, we're so close! This this movie, it's got to be, it's my second favorite behind Temple of Doom. In in the whole the, uh... Indiana Jones, you know, kind of saga. Just, yeah. Even the beginning with River Phoenix involved, I, I, I enjoy it a lot as well. It's probably my least favorite part of the movie, but I still enjoy it. The beginning sequence a little bit. Kind of like Indy's origin, yeah. But I still enjoy it overall. Oh, the whole, th the whole—it's a solid bar of gold. Mm -hmm. The entire movie, and it's the weird thing is that I agree with you. Temple has always been my personal favorite, mm -hmm. and yet Last Crusade is just so fucking great. I mean, there's nothing bad about I it. I think I get the most enjoyment out of watching Last Crusade. That might be so. Then I do with and all of them. It's also what Goldfinger did, which was that. The second movie has a really serious theme, so we might as well just have this fun, lighthearted version mm -hmm. for the third. That's I, that just seems to be the way to go. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I mean, taking all to get all three of the originals are just untouchably great. So yeah, and if if you said any of those was your favorite, I wouldn't fight you. But yeah, yeah it's so yeah, hard it's, to choose. It's, it's one of those. Yeah, it's just one of those movies where, and you know, same thing with the original Star Wars three. It's like if, if somebody mentioned to me Return of the Jedi or New Hope was their favorite of the three. I would be like, yeah, I, I can see that. And mm -hmm. same with Indiana Jones, the first three, I could be like, okay, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Last Crusade, Temple of Doom. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah, th this was, God, this, it's, it's such a fun movie to watch. It really is. It's really just a fun movie from start to finish. It's, de it, it's definitely a, a master class in how to make a great movie because, mm -hmm. I mean, you were talking about the action scenes. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of them. There I mean, there's the thing lot. on the train, and the and there's the the airplane fight, and there's the, the tank, thing on the tank when the boat. There's a tank. There's a tank chase with a fist fight happening at the same time, <laughs> and then he jumps off a horse. There's a and boat, they have the boat chase, and, and then they have the, the motorcycle bridge, chase. And, yeah, and uh. then you have the the sewage part as well. Oh yeah, they go in the sewer. Light the fire. Fire. Yeah, they, where they just light everything on fire, and then there's the gun scenes on horses too. Yeah. They have horses and tanks and boats and planes and motorcycles. I, I just... They hit everything. Oh, there's also... I guess you can say the... Um, the um, camels. The, the camels. <laughs> and the, and the, the, the Hindenburg. The, 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 oh, yeah. The, the flip. The, the flip. I couldn't think of it. What the fuck is that thing? Oh, the God. Zeppelin. Yeah, the Zeppelin. Zeppelin, that's yeah. right. Oh, that's great. Yeah, he was just John Connery reading the newspaper. And he was just like... Arr. God, it's good. Ticket, please. It's, yeah. <laughs> no tickets. Ah, man, they just don't make them like that. I know, and you know, if you put anybody else as Indiana Jones's dad, other than Sean Connery, would it have worked? No. 
Agreed. No, this is a case where I don't think so. Agreed. I, I don't even know. I mean, you can't put anybody else in that. Room. Who would they pick? I don't know. I I, I, mean, I don't know. Gregory Peck, somebody like that. I don't know. Even a lot during that I, time. I don't know. I mean, it would have had to be somebody old enough to be Harrison Ford's dad. So it'd be somebody. Nobody has that charm like Sean Connery. Somebody from that generation. I don't know who else you could have done it. Who would have had that? His his dad has so like it's so strange in the movie because like you get a you get his in the beginning of the movie you get his silhouette. When River Phoenix comes, he's like, Dad, I can bring my dad! <laughs> in Latin. Yes. Uh, so, you, you know, you get your image at first where he's like this strict, just like, no mischief, no monkey shines, no nonsense type of person. And then you get to meet him and get to yeah. know him a bit more. And you're like, dude, he's just as fucking daffy as Indiana. In fact, I think Indiana <laughs> Jones is more serious than him. Yeah, it's great. To, it's just like it's just like complete like whoa role reversal in some ways. It's it's great to see you know the legendary Connery in a in the part of a guy who's like totally physically inept, mm -hmm. like who doesn't know how to drive a motorcycle or do any action mm -hmm. hero type stuff, and he's kind of like this bumbling old fool. But it, it, but you but is also him. but is also brilliant. I can't believe you shot him. Let's go, Dad. <laughs> what you did. <laughs> Dad, what? Dad, what? Dad, what? Head for the fireplace. The castle's on fire. <laughs> oh my god! I'm like, it's just non-stop action. Even like when he's making out with the doctor, it seems yeah, like Doctor like, Schneider. Doctor Schneider, yeah, it's just like this hardcore, like action, aggressive kissing. You're just like, holy shit, dude! Is everything action packed in this movie? It's just, it's crazy. <laughs> So yeah, seriously, this movie is just fucking like bonkers. It's it's like one of the most action-packed like from start to finish movies I've ever seen. Just like everything is action, seagulls and kissing. <laughs> and and Sean, uh, I mean, Sean Connery literally kills Nazis with seagulls and a fountain pen. And a fountain pen. That's oh yeah, the fountain pen. <laughs> Shit. The pen is my job and the sword. Oh my god. It. it <laughs> God, I'm just reliving it in my mind now. So excuse me a minute, but uh, I I think what I, what I was gonna get at is um, as far as why he should have got the Oscar for this one again twice in a row um, is is it's I don't know it's probably it's probably two hours the whole movie. I mean it's not extremely long. Yeah, it's it's maybe a shade under two hours. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's not much at all. And it's and it's packed. To, you know, from from cover to cover, basically, mm -hmm. with awesome creative action scenes, and yet the the little things like when they have the conversation over the dinner table about how we never talked, and uh, the, the moment when he's hanging over the ledge and he goes Indiana, I think stuff like that. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. Stuff <laughs> stuff like I that can, just kind I of. Can reach it, Dad. <laughs> oh, and we lose Doctor Schneider too. Rest in peace. She was the best. No, oh, she she was she was the best love interest of all three of them. For sure, she For was sure. great. Point being, the little what few there are, the little kind of quiet character moments are just as good. It's basically, I mean, it, it pretty much as great as Jaws, you know, in the Spielberg canon. For me, it's just one of those movies that, from start to finish, is filled with greatness. Yeah, even even his one confrontation with um. Uh, <laughs> Where's the diary, Dr. Jones? Where are you hiding? Ah, yes. <laughs> and it's kind of a reply to him. You know, something about it taught me to read books rather than burning them or something like mm -hmm. that. I think that's a great line. God, that movie. is good, too. Dude, dude they, they went back to Berlin. Into the lion's den. Into the lion's den. <laughs> and literally, I, I, to me, the best scene of the entire movie is, like, it doesn't involve Sean Connery, it involves Harrison Ford, where he bumps into Adolf Hitler... <laughs> And he just looks down at the book. He si like he like they they have it, like the top the, the the big cheese has what they need, and he literally signs it. Doesn't look enthusiastic about it all. Like oh great another dipshit wants my autograph. Signs it, just smacks <laughs> it against his chest, straight like stone cold face, and just walks off. The I I had basically from the time I was born been watching the Indiana Jones movie, so I had kind of forgotten all the little comedy beats like that like what they mean in the story until i watched it with a couple of friends of mine who had never seen it and i was like what do you mean you've never seen it? but anyway they've never seen it so i watched it in like that moment everybody just busted up 
crying with laughter when he writes Adolf Hitler in the diary. <laughs> and then the, you know, the no ticket scene when he punches him out the oh, plane and stuff. So, you know, I think, I think the, I think the Indiana Jones saga should have ended with Last Crusade. I mean, they, I mean, even the title says The Last Crusade. And they literally ride off into the sunset mm-hmm. yeah, at the end. It's the last run. Just mm-hmm. let Indy go in peace. Well, I have to say, whenever I marathon the series, I don't include the fourth one anyway. No, so nobody does. Nobody in the right mind In our does. hearts, there are only three. Yeah. There is there is not one person I've ever met <laughs> who likes the fourth movie that's seen it. I think that's universally accepted by all of us. Like, wow, that was pure shit. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean... Do you agree? Do you do, do you agree that that's one of Connery's finest performances in any of his movies? I th- well, we'll get to to certain of my opinions in a bit here, but yeah, definitely. Uh, not only is he great in it, but it's so different from how you're used to seeing him. Yeah, as James Bond, you know. I th- uh, I th- I think he makes that movie even better. Yeah, for I, sure. I, re- I really do. I think he's kind of just the sprinkles on top, just really makes this movie complete. I mean, to to have had, you know, already two movies that are that are just picture perfect, start mm-hmm. to finish, and like, the pressure must have been on, I think, to deliver when it comes to the third one. How can we make it bigger, better, awesome, cool, mm-hmm. you know, and have more weight, have more meaning, get the family aspect in there. All of it they just pulled off, and I think Sean was a big part of that, for sure. Agreed. Disney, please, for the love of God, do not make <laughs> any more, do not make any more Indiana Jones movies. Well. Please. We'll see if they take our advice. They won't. They're whores. <laughs> Capitalist whores. <laughs> Anyways, well, what speaking, do you have next? Speaking of whores. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, we left off with the Great Train Robbery, which brings... Well, this is going to be easy to clean out some of my list here, because at fourth place I have The Untouchables. Now, we already discussed how awesome that movie is. Nothing more can be said. I, That's he, he won the Oscar. He... He was great. That movie's great. I yeah, yeah. I, I pretty much covered it, and I, I agree. It has. To, it had. It originally was not on my list, but then the more I kept thinking about, it, I'm like, it's gotta be. It's gotta be on there. Yeah, that that's been one of my favorites for a long time. I think I discovered it when I was like 12 or so. You know, yeah, it, it was always on TV. Yeah, I always noticed it on TV. By the way, do not watch it on TV. Buy the movie because then you can just watch. It's like it's it's the same thing yeah, like watching Scarface. <laughs> like I don't understand why people would watch Scarface on TV when it's going to be like ninety percent censored. Well, they don't know that maybe. I know something. They can't be that dumb. Nah, I don't know. Can't be that dumb. They can't. I don't know. There's cocaine and guys <laughs> getting sliced in half with a chainsaw. They, they just they can't. But who knows? Yes, agreed. What's next? Next up is third place, which uh, I put down Highlander. And I was <laughs> going to say, and I don't care what you think, but I've, apparently you agree with me, so... I, I like Highlander, and I think he, he like like I, like I we mentioned, yeah. he was only in it for like 10 minutes. Yeah. 15 minutes. It's just, he, he makes the movie great. One of my favorite storylines, honestly. I think it's really creative. Yeah, it, it, a bunch of immortals battling to, there can only be one for absolute power and knowledge. Hell yeah, I'm in. The tr- damn time. The trouble is that there was just no room left to make a sequel from that story, but they tried anyway. Yeah. And that's where things went bad. They tried. I mean, you can only, you can only do There can so be much. only one. Yeah, you can only do so much, like, pretty much with that series. If you're going to tell something, you got to tell it, you know, backwards, you know. From, yeah, that's the trouble. So, so they're, they're basically prequels and you can't go forward. It's just, it just doesn't work that way with that, with that mm-hmm. type of movie. No, I mean, I, I, I definitely like it. It's an interesting choice to put Christopher Lambert because I don't think he was well known during that time. Yeah. And you know, he had, you know, he's a French actor, so yeah. the English is kind of broken, but he's the lead. It's basically the lead, the main character in that movie. So, but you know, they pulled, they pulled it off great. It's a great action movie, but yeah, it's just... The Highlanders a one. It's a one. It should have been a one and done. Thing. Yeah, for sure. Leave it at one. You got the Queen soundtrack. You got Sean Connery. You got a great storyline. Great action scenes. Good special effects for their time too. Excellent special um, effects. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, one and done. Because you hmm. you won't be able to top it. And you know what? I'm surprised that they haven't tried to remake this movie. Yeah. Uh, well, apparently they've been trying to get a script together, but. 
my god, just let it go. Can, can any of these people get anything new for once? There can be only one. Any, any anything new? Hello, Hollywood? <laughs> think McFly, think. Well, that brings me to second place on my list, the silver medal winner, which is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. <laughs> so we've almost cleaned house here. I, this is one where it I couldn't put it at first because it's not my personal favorite. But I think it's probably the best movie he ever made. All around, there's just nothing bad you can say about it. Yeah, there, there really isn't. There, I mean, for anybody in that movie, there really isn't anything mm. bad. Mm. Sometimes I'm torn. Like, do I want to put Last Crusade at number one? Sometimes I think that way. Because, like like I told you you know, earlier, it's out of the three, it's the one I get the most enjoyment out of watching. When I, I don't think it's the best. I think Temple of Doom still right. is. When I was a kid, Temple of Doom was always my favorite, but as I become an old man, Last Crusade keeps climbing up there. Yeah. And Last I, I'd say was, they're tied, at uh, least. Last Crusade was always the one out of the three that it was always on TV the most. It yeah, it's the most family-appropriate. Uh, mm -hmm. That's my right, I dig it. It's my theory, anyway. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just like, maybe in five, ten years from now, I'll be like, you know what, Last Crusade? It's the best. But what about Indiana Jones number six? Fuck! <laughs> Fuck Disney! Oh, God. Maybe we'll die before then. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. We'll have to wait and see. We'll have to watch him in hell. <laughs> oh, God. Over and over again for all eternity. Only uh, only Kingdom of the Crystal Skull <laughs> to the present day we're not allowed to watch. One, two, three. No! God, no! Um, all right. We're down to one each. Who wants to go first? Well, I was going to ask you th that very question, my good sir. Well, we're at a standoff here, so... All right. I'll go. Um, now, you said you've got one movie left, and you didn't think I ever would have picked this one. I don't right? I don't think you have ever would have picked it, so okay. I will give you one guess. Um, like I said, it's not... I leave The Great Train Robbery as his <laughs> finest performance of any movie I've seen him in. But this one is... I think he does a really good job in. Is it Thunderball? It is not. Okay, what, what the hell is it? It is Finding Forrester. Oh, I thought you might say that. It is Finding Forrester. You're the man now, dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it is this movie. And I actually saw this movie for the first time, I think, two years ago, two or three oh, years really? ago. So, so mm. I had never seen it. So basically, it's about this kid who lives in the projects in the Bronx. Hmm. Um, and he's very talented. He's a very gifted writer, um, he's athletic, but you know, he lives like very underprivileged and he doesn't believe in himself, he just wants to be one of the, he knows he's not part of the clique, I guess you could say, hmm. because he, he knows, I think deep down inside he knows he's he's um, very smart, very talented, he's kind of above the rest, but he doesn't want to accept that. Yeah. So well, and he kind of has nobody else he can talk to about and, it. Either. Exactly, he's kind of like it's kind of like a coming of age. He's kind of conflicted, um, you know, kind of like a self identity. Who am I? Type of person, and so he runs into Sean Connery's character. Some say he's kind of portrayed as like J.D. Salinger in mm. this um, movie. So he comes across him. I think I'm trying to remember. I think they try to break in to his apartment i believe his friends dare him to break into the old man's apartment because yeah. everybody is scared of him so he gets it but and he, he goes leaves, and he leaves he his backpack he leaves his backpack that has his writings he kind of yes. writes privately it's kind of like his his mode of escape and so like of course he's surprised that he's that sean connor is there and so he throws the bag out the window and he basically tells him to write like an essay, 5,000 words or something like that of why you should not break into my apartment. And he does it and he gives it to him. And um, then they kind of talk a little more. And he tries to mentor him and he improves on his writing, his life. And then, of course, he submits it in school. And then I think kind of the one teacher notices that, hey, you know, he kind of like assumes he's like plagiarized, plagiarizing. Yeah. Um, and I think F. Murray Abraham's the teacher. I was going to say that. Do I remember that right? Yeah, F. Murray Abraham. Yeah. I said, and that's where the story takes off. And they kind of befriend each other. And Sean Connery is like the mentor. The kind of like the, you know, kind of helping this kid shape his life. And deciding you, you're very gifted. You have a chance here. And it's, it's a very moving movie. And I think Sean Connery does a really good job in this. Like I kind of, I kind of pictured that's who Sean Connery is in real life. I, I probably. Yeah, I think to me that's like a movie. He probably like, doesn't like to have many visitors. Probably not, but I feel like that's kind of the movie where it kind of resembles 
to him closely if I had to guess who he was as a person mm. outside of the camera. And I think that's why this movie hits me well with Sean Connery a lot. I, 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 in the back of my mind, I thought you might pick that one, but mm. it, it would be nowhere near my top ten. But he is very good in it. Yeah, it's a perfectly a, fine movie. Yeah, it's a it's a fine movie. It's it's nothing. It's it's a, it's a moving movie. It's kind of like um, you know, it's it is what it is. It is. It's just a coming of age movie, and Sean Connery is kind of like the guy who's living in the twilight um, years. He's, he went through a lot of stuff, and I think he you know he kind of gave up on life, and he met this kid. They became friends, and he kind of had his second chance before he dies in the movie. Yeah. So. It's uh, it kind of fits in that genre with like scent of a woman maybe mm -hmm. those kind of uh, in the nineties they were big those inspirational dramas yeah and if you like that kind of thing it's definitely one of the good ones yeah it, it's definitely a good movie to check out at least once in your life and you know it's it's a it's a very moving movie and it's you know something that will keep you entertained it's not like the greatest but you know it's something where yeah. if you're bored on an afternoon give it a, give it a watch it's pretty good good cast of characters and it's a good story. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah, and Finding I recommend Forrester, it for sure. Yeah, Finding Forrester was um the one the one movie I left off the list that I did replace the Untouchables, um with was uh, For Your Eyes Only. Or no wait, You Only Live Twice. I got I got For Your For Your Eyes Only, which was Roger Moore mixed up with Sean Connery there for a moment. Yep, You Only Live Twice, which is one of my favorite Bond movies. But the more I think about it, is one I had too many Bond movies on there. I felt. I, two. I wasn't sure you weren't going to have all seven Bond movies. No, I, I mean, I, I can't add Diamonds Are Forever. No, no, okay. I just couldn't do it. Thunderball, that was your guess. Oh, boy. Well, I just I was trying to think of something I wouldn't like. Mm -hmm. You know, I do like You Only Live Twice. I mean, it, it gets kind of knocked to the bottom of the list these days. Mm -hmm. But I think for for underrated, it's an underrated yeah, movie. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, Donald Pleasance as Blofeld is what makes yeah. it great. Any and Sean Connery poses as a poor man's Japanese person. Yeah, but you know it is what it is. But it's it's entertaining. It's one of my favorites. I would I would put it in the top ten favorite Bond movies for me. But that's the one I left off my list, which was tough. And I'm like I I, I have to, hmm. which I replaced with the Untouchables. Um, I would like to make one slight. Shout out to Never Say Never again. <laughs> okay. Because I, I finally saw a picture of what Sean Connery looked like in 1983. Hmm. Bald. Just not looking like what James Bond looks like. Damn, they did a good job on him. <laughs> that toupee. That's all I have to say. It's... I guess the the only one that I have any sort of malice toward is probably Diamonds Are Forever. I don't love Thunderball just because it's it's really gimmicky. But you know, I'd still, I'd still watch it. I'd still watch it. He just Potter swims Potter. for the whole thing. That kind of gets on my nerves. <laughs> just scuba dives and swims and harpoons people. That's it. The entertainment value is still there. I guess is what I'm saying. But I I would I'd probably put it at like number six out of all his Bond movies. Okay. And since we're talking honorable mentions, uh, there are two that I had to leave off my list that I felt a little bit of guilt about. Okay. One's The Hunt for Red October, which I think is a great one. Yeah, you know, it's surprising neither of us said The Hunt for the Red October. I yeah. was going to think you, I was going to lean more towards you were going to have that on your list if it was going to be between the two of us. I'll, I'll be honest, I don't really care for that movie a whole don't lot. Hmm. Like, it, it is what it is, but I think Sean Connery pretty much makes that movie interesting. Well, I left it off my top ten, but I still think it's a good one. Yeah, he, it's one if you have nothing to do on an afternoon. Sure. Watch it, sure. yeah. And then the other one is A Bridge Too Far. Oh. Hmm. Which is, <laughs> not for the faint of heart, maybe, because yeah. it's like a three and a half hour movie, but it's this, it's a, a drama about like the closing days of World War II. And this this particular incident that that went completely wrong. Spoilers mm -hmm. ahead, I guess. Uh, it's about Operation Market Garden, which was this plan to drop thousands of paratroops behind enemy lines in uh, in Europe, and the whole thing was a disaster, and you know, lots of loss of life. But it does have a great cast between Sean Connery, Michael Caine, Robert Redford, Gene Hackman, uh, all in all in great roles as the allies and uh it's 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 just, it's, a, it's a good drama maybe uh maybe not quite as moving as finding forrester or something like that mm -hmm. but if you if you like that time in history 
uh, I think it does a great job of, of recreating it. Yeah. So, you're down to one movie now. I'm down to one movie, which, as it happens, is probably my personal favorite. And I also think is his greatest performance. Your favorite Sean Connery movie? Yes. And we have not named this on either on my list. Nobody's either. brought it up. Nobody's brought it up. Okay. It's not entrapment, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? Nope. Okay. It's not Zardoz, is it? It's not Zardoz. <laughs> <laughs> the penis is evil. The gun is good. <laughs> um, so it's not Bond. Mm -hmm. What decade? Uh, the 1970s. I don't know. Well, so I realize, and uh, you must forgive me, I've become one of those assholes who puts an obscure movie in the top spot. But I love this movie to death and back. So it's The Wind and the Lion. Oh! <laughs> Well, <laughs> which, um, uh, no, I should, I should, I should know better. Oh my God. I should have known this. You know, I left this movie off my list. Um, but I, I enjoy it. Yeah, I, I do. I, the, you know, when, when we watched it, you know, I enjoyed it. I can understand why people don't like this movie. Mm. It is a very slow pacing movie. Very slow. I'll put it to you this way. If you can't get through Lawrence of Arabia, chances <laughs> are you're not going to get through The Wind and the Lion. I think it's a great movie. <laughs> but you should. It needs some culture. Anytime Sean Connery like poses as um, an Arabian, I'm all in. This man's done everything pretty much, so I'm all in. I, I Teddy guess, Roosevelt? I, I guess mean, I'll talk us through it. So, yeah. uh, so Sean Connery plays this uh, Moroccan Berber chieftain named Murai Raisuli. Uh, and some of this is based in reality. He was a real person. The events are obviously embellished, let's say. Uh, so he kidnaps an American woman who's there, I guess, just on holiday, mm -hmm. uh, and and her two children. And her name is Mrs. Pedicarish, uh, played by Candace Bergen, who yeah. I had never really seen in anything else, but she's spectacular in this movie. I think hers is a great performance, too. Uh, and then, so he kidnaps her and demands a ransom from the American President Roosevelt. And uh, so Teddy Roosevelt is played... He's fucking hunting in this movie <laughs> in Yellowstone. He's like doing the most stereotypical like Teddy Roosevelt things yeah. that you could possibly have. He's, he's like, he's got like boxing gloves on. He's next to the bear he's killed. I mean, he's, he's everything Teddy Roosevelt you can think of is yeah. in this movie. Yeah, so, <laughs> so Teddy is played amazingly. By Brian Keith, uh, and I, I just think between him and Connery as the Raisuli and Candace Bergen uh, holding up her end, it's three of the best acting performances you could ever see in anything. In this movie that is like, it's halfway between being an Arabian epic, but it also has this real silliness to it uh, in, in like the American parts with Teddy Roosevelt and his advisors and his boxing matches, and he, he shoots... Uh, he shoots at this big poster of the Tsar of Russia because he's doing target practice. Um, everything is over the top. He jumps onto a table to impersonate a grizzly bear because he doesn't like this artist's version of a grizzly bear. And he says, you should always be portrayed in an upright fighting stance. And it's, so it's everything you ever dreamed about Teddy is just come to life in this movie. That's one aspect of it that's awesome. And then um, Sean, as Raisuli, is just... I don't know, a sight to behold for me. I think it's his strongest performance of his career. I haven't seen absolutely everything he ever made, but I, there's something he about... He gives her a lot of crap in that movie, yes. too. It's great. I, I, all the elements of what made Sean, Sean, between the, the his ability to deliver, you know, impossible dialogue, you know, like we were talking about his, his theater background, mm -hmm. his ability to, you know, fit into costume, fit into period, time period... All of it. It's just like when you when you give him a role that's this larger than life, he somehow just had the ability to make it work, which not very many people from any generation would be able to do. And I think entrusting him was the right choice. And un unfortunately, it's a movie that basically nobody knows about. Why do you think? I gave you my reasons, but why do you think people don't like the times? There was the, you know, this. I think, what was it, last year that you showed this movie to a couple people and you were like, I was the only one in the group that enjoyed this movie. Uh, and I enjoyed it all the more because they hated it. But um, 
Why do you think people that, like don't really care about this movie? I, I think it's just very slow pacing and bores the hell out of people. It's 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 a very specific niche, and it happens to be one that I belong to. But it, it's like I said, it's kind of like one of those Lawrence of Arabia type movies. It's it's kind of a love letter to things like Treasure Island and King Solomon's Mines. They're about adventure and and you know sword fights with uh, with uh, <laughs> with the filthy villains, and it's it's very very over the top. It's basically like a Victorian boys adventure story come to life on the screen. Not everybody enjoys that sort of thing. In fact, quite a lot of people are just puzzled by it. It's like I said, it, it has this very distinctive sense of humor that if you don't get, then you're probably watching the movie like, what the hell is happening? Because it doesn't take itself too seriously, but just enough that it's a, that it's a really fun romp. In my opinion, now maybe some people are bored to death by it. But uh, for me, it's just, it's, it's of an era that will never come back to us, that, that simple time of just pure entertainment, pure storytelling. I wish we had the old music of breaking news. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Did you just say, it's a period, an era that we'll never get back. Finally, finally you're on the train with me about something where <laughs> things are never going to come back. I, this is... This is breaking news. This is bigger than the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> I, I mean, you name it. This is big. I, I, I am speechless, sir. <laughs> I never thought I would hear you say those words. You, you were like, I remember a few episodes ago, you were like, Westerns are going to come back. God damn it. They're going to come back. The era will rise again. But this right here, I... I, I, I well, yeah. I mean, I want them to. I just... I don't know, maybe that's wishful thinking, but I don't know. <laughs> yes, I don't know. yes, you're... Oh, You've broken me, is that what oh, you want to yes, hear? I'm dead, yes. I'm dead inside. I want you to say it. <laughs> you have conformed to my dark <laughs> side of mind thinking. And we're years. all doomed. We're all doomed, we're fucked, the stock market's gonna crash, <laughs> and everybody's gonna eat raw chicken for dinner forever. This is this is. Uh, and no no Christmas for Tiny Tim. No Christmas for Tiny Tim. <laughs> Noah's Ark's gonna sink. It's it's everything. Everything <laughs> I've ever wanted. Well. Wow. What a great note to end on. I, I mean, you know what? I agree, though. This That era's done. The, the whole set... The, I agree. The 70s is a decade of movies that is very underrated. Never gets looked at. The only movies that people remember from the 70s are either Star Wars, Jaws, or The Godfather. Hmm. Yeah, it's totally unfair. It's totally unfair. We're not saying those movies are bad, but a lot of movies get overlooked. This yeah, is yeah, it's one very of them. strange. Yeah. in the in the in the case of Sean Connery's career, he had this this really, in my opinion, tragic thing happen, which is that he walked away from Bond, mm -hmm. and some some people were just so devastated by that that they couldn't even look at him in another movie. Uh, and and it's really unfair because during that decade he made some of the best quality stuff of, of his whole life. Yeah. And yet people never will go it, back and look at it. It's interesting with certain actors to get filled into a certain role. And some actors can come out like completely great, refining their role, saying, I can't do other things. Sean Connery made it out of James Bond. James yeah. Bond's like one of those iconic pop culture characters but then you got but then on the other hand you see you know examples like um you know the guy the 50s actor that played superman i can't think of him oh george reeves george reeves yeah and you know i mean he took his own life basically at the mm. end of it allegedly <laughs> um but yeah like he just went back to krypton yeah <laughs> i'm going back to krypton there's nothing here blew up but yeah he, he couldn't like even though he was trying to find other work he like everyone's like oh that's superman and so, you know, yeah. for a while, they're like, it's James Bond. I think those actors, like, no, I can do other things. Like, the the only, I mean, Mark Hamill redefined himself by being the voice of the Joker. But for a while, for a long time, everybody was like, oh, yeah. Luke Skywalker. Yeah, it took him forever. Daniel Radcliffe, the same thing. Hell, oh, Harry Potter. Yeah. There he is. So it's kind of like some actors can pull it off. That's just the greatness of Sean. I mean, Sean was doing movies while, you know, he was still James Bond, though, too. Um, it's it, for me. It's kind of a tragedy. It took until basically Highlander and The Untouchables, mm -hmm. when people finally remembered, "Hey, he's pretty great." You know, start giving him Oscars, start giving him big parts in movies. Yeah, but the, throughout the seventies, James Bond an Oscar. Yeah, exactly. 
through th yeah throughout the 70s and early 80s he really struggled to get you know respect i would say which sucks because you know in my opinion let me see almost half my list uh were made during that time and totally almost totally ignored real shame it is you um um, I would like to share some interesting facts about Mr. Connery since yep. we're going back on the subject. By all means. So I looked up some f interesting, you know, random facts about this this man here, and um, some were some we kind of mentioned, you know, during the episode. For example, he worked, you know, like polishing coffins. For example, there's yeah, I've read, and I some of it's probably bullshit, but I've read a long list of things he used to do before. Mm -hmm. fame. A milkman. Hmm. But here, um, you mentioned he was a bodybuilder. He uh, participated in the Mr. Universe contest in 1953. So there was that. He, um, <laughs> we mentioned he was in the Navy. He has a, he had a tattoo that said Scotland forever. <laughs> Wait a minute! I did not know that. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> oh, God bless him. Now you know. Um, <laughs> Scotland, he was discharged because of ulcers in his stomach, so that's why he left the Ooh. Navy um, for that, and then he went to art school, I guess. Um, what do you think was Sean's favorite Bond film that he did? Oh, um, God, what would it be? Probably Goldfinger? From Russia with Love. Oh, really? Yep. Confirmed it with, um, in, a, in an interview with ABC News, so there's that. I'll be dead. Um, it's because it's the classiest one. Interesting enough, I'm, I'm sure you might... There are two roles that he turned down, famously. Um, one, he turned down the offer to portray Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. I heard about that one, yeah. He's saying he had no idea what the hell these novels were even about. <laughs> couldn't understand it. Yeah. And he... I guess he just wasn't real fond of filming in New Zealand for over a year and a half. Eh. Um, the other role that he turned down was in The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolution. He was going to play the role of the architect. Can you imagine Sean Connery in the Matrix trilogies? I, to be honest, have not seen the sequels ever. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, that's one where I think he might feel horribly out of place. Yep. I don't know. There's something very modern about the Matrix and something yeah. very old-fashioned about Sean. You, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the Matrix one day because I, I wouldn't mind doing the episode on the first one. But it's a classic example for me of so much potential and it got blown up. Hmm. So, but that's for another day. Um, very good friends with Michael Caine. I mean, who wouldn't be good friends with Michael Caine? I would this, have a drink. This with him. one was the most striking. Where I'm like, that's bullshit. And then <laughs> I'm like, then again, maybe not. He was once stopped by a policeman for speeding. The cop's name: Sergeant James Bond. <laughs> God bless him. Yep. And did he write him up? I wonder. <laughs> I, did he let him go? I don't know. Those are some of your notable facts huh. for Sean Connery. Okay, let's switch the topic here. Sure. Um, worst movie you've ever seen Sean Connery in? Um, well, there are really three front runners for me. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think the most heartbreaking movie he ever did was Highlander 2, The Quickening. Oh, Just because the first oh, is so great. Oh, and then, yeah, you were talking about Wasted Potential? There, there you go, Highlander oh, 2. <laughs> oh, Although, uh, along the same lines, we, we've already talked about this, but Diamonds Are Forever just is not very good. <laughs> that movie, it is what it is. If it wasn't for Sean, I probably would put it at the bottom of my list. It took. I think it took a long time for the series to recover from that particular movie. I think they recovered just fine. I think... I. Like, That's it's because just you're like, a traitor. I know, I'm a traitor. <laughs> I love Roger Moore's Bond, too. I, I think it was just... I think there was a part that Sean was just done... Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's just like, give me my money and I'll leave. Oh, we know that. Mm -hmm. I think he demanded, like, the world's biggest salary ever at that point in order to do it. I think so. I think. And then gave most of it to uh, the Education Trust of Scotland, or I, I don't know its official name, but mm -hmm. basically the idea was to improve schools, which you have to admire, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if he did it for that, you know, why not? Yeah. Oh, and Zardoz. <laughs> <laughs> He did, I, I thought he was great in that movie. I mean, him fl in a floating head. I, I, God, I wonder, like, 
I just want to know his thought process. He got the script, and he was just like, ah, fuck it. Well, according to what I read, he he took he happened to be friends with John Borman, the director, mm-hmm. but he basically took that role because after Bond, nobody would hire him for anything else. So he just basically needed the work. Yeah. But anyway, we'll miss him terribly. We should close out something happy. Yeah, you know, I don't think we'll ever have another actor like him. Um, you know, he certainly set the bar so high for one of the greatest pop culture icons to James Bond. I mean, sure. you and I both agree that he's the greatest. Many people do, too. No contest. Yeah, it's it's a no contest for a lot of us. I want to say Sean Connery might have been the first, or at least the earliest in my mind, where you, you play such an iconic role, and you may not escape from it, but he did. That was rough yeah, it, in the beginning. It, it, that's definitely one in a million, because, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think of the other ones, like Errol Flynn. I think he was always Robin Hood, no matter what. Well, he always played movies like that, that's yeah. for sure. He got stuck in that, for sure. Yeah. Christopher Lee could only do horror for a long time. Mm-hmm. But that, but that tells you that that's how good he was. Yeah, there, there's... I don't know. There's something about his... Pro- probably something about his, you know working class background in Scotland and 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 in the in the hard years when he was growing up in the 30s and 40s and then maybe some of his military background just all contributed to this guy who has a real sense of self-assurance mm-hmm. about him and that that really comes across on screen he's somebody that uh I think you trust what he says and I think he knows what he's saying you know what I mean he just has that authority to mm-hmm. him and that's something that that you really prize in a leading man for sure yeah. Uh, there's just nobody else quite like him. It's definitely a different, different era in acting, and we will not have another Sean Connery. No, but we will have many more Sean Connery marathons. I think so. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I want to see the kid of the leprechauns here. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my God. You're going to love it. So, anyway, uh, Sean, rest in peace. We miss you. You made some of the greats. We're not going to have another Sean Connery. That's just sad. No, very true. Definitely one of the uh, one of the all time pillars of the movie business. Mm-hmm. Wherever you're at, I hope you're having a good time. I hope you're they're not making you do Zardos over and over again <laughs> in the league of extraordinary. Genre. If I if I had some bagpipes, I would play us off. I think that would be a fitting tribute. <laughs> well, so anyway, Scotland forever. Adios, Sean.